French lick. Okay. There we are, guys. We are live on the Metal Voice. Uh, you know, uh, another tribute to our friend Steve Grimmett, but this time around we have uh, Nick Bocott, who's uh, spent years with Nick as a bandmate, as a friend. Um, but before we begin, I just want to uh, outline sort of the what's going on in regards to the funeral. Let me just bring it up. So for everybody out there, you can still, first of all, I'd like to say that the GoFundMe page is still up. It's very expensive, the funeral and the aftermath of the funeral. The You know, Steve, as we mentioned many times, was not a rich man. He was always, I guess we'll say struggling in a sense. Uh, of course, being handicapped as well later on in his life, it didn't help his financial matters. So any money that you can, you know, send their way to the Grimmett family, much appreciated. The link was not put up by the Grimmett family. It was put up by friends who were, uh, you know, passionate about helping the Grimmets out, Millie especially, uh, because the funeral costs were so bad and there's a lot of bills to be paid after the funeral. So if you can, you know, lend some support there, much appreciated. Number two, on Wednesday the 7th, uh, Oh, and by the way, the link is in the video description for the GoFundMe. So in this video description, there, there is where the GoFundMe page link is. Number two, Wednesday, September the 7th at 2 p.m. UK time, which is uh, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Steve's funeral will be held at Toxbury Abbey. After that, there will be a, uh, the, uh, there will be a wake held at the Watson Hall in Toxbury, just a few minutes away, walk away. And they encourage everybody to show up. There's going to be a glass of, raising a glass for Steve and a bit of food for everybody. Um, and this event will also be streamed. I hope I didn't forget anything. So for the people around the world who can't be physically at this funeral, the event will be streamed. The link will be shared in the description of this video after we finished here okay i hope i mentioned everything if i forgot anything nick please you know advise us cool i will do first and foremost two things jimmy and alan yes. thank you so much for the heartfelt tributes you've already paid to steve because i know they meant the world to me i know they meant the world to millie and the grimmett family and probably to fans all over the world as well so thank you so much for that and um just a minor point. It's Tewkesbury. It's and that's yeah. just that's just a weird English pronunciation. <laughs> Tox- Jimmy's I'm famous trying... for this mispronunciation. It, uh, it's kind it, of his thing. Yeah, yeah, to- yeah. Tewkesbury sounds cool. It's yeah, going Tewkesbury. Yeah, yeah Tew- I, will, I will confess, I never learned to read. <laughs> I joined the club. Yeah, joined the club. Tewkesbury. Thank you. <laughs> um, right off the bat. Uh, you know, is there, we'll just start off by saying, uh, Nick, thank you so much for jumping on. Just, you know, tell us uh, your thoughts of Steve and, you know, and just finding out of his passing, you know, let's just start things off like that. Yeah. You know, well, as, as we all know, you know, sadly, Steve lost his leg a few years ago while on tour in South America. And, you know, that obviously didn't help matters, but Steve being Steve, got back on it. I was going to say got back on his feet, got back on his foot as soon as possible after that and got back on stage. And if people think I'm being horrible by saying that, that foot joke, my first conversation with Steve, you know, I, I called him after, after the surgery and we started joking about, Hey, that like the next time we play together and it will become grim reaper again, we should both dress as pirates so he can come on with his peg leg and, you know, <laughs> And, and that was Steve's spirit. You know, the thing I loved about Steve Grimmett, and it's a commonplace thing for people to go after someone sadly passes, oh, they were the best person ever. And that's not always true, I'm afraid to say. But in the case of Steve, he was an exceptional human being, as I know both Jimmy and Alan I'm speaking to right now can attest. No ego, very selfless, very interested in others. He made you feel like, he was talking to you not like you were talking to him and wonderful sense of humor and he was a glass half full guy you know i think there are two types of person on this planet some view the glass is half empty and emptying even more steve always saw it as, as being okay it's half full let me fill it again and that's just a perception thing and it 
it paid dividends for him, obviously, because what he achieved in his 62 years, and it's horrible to say that 62 is way too short, yeah. was, was quite remarkable. Not not just the Grim Reaper stuff, but that Onslaught record, geez, what a great album that was, In Search of Sanity. Why that didn't take them to, to be the big five. Yep, exactly. It should have been the big five based on that album. It's really that good. And unfortunately, it didn't, for whatever reasons, the music industry that we all know is a fickle thing. It just didn't click for whatever reason. It didn't go viral, to use common, like, modern terms. But, yeah, he was he was always, you know, the, the biggest compliment I can pay Steve, apart from his voice, which goes with that saying, is I, I was looking back and I honestly can't remember him ever getting really angry and shouting at someone <laughs> because that just wasn't in his nature. Like he would, sure, he would get upset, but he didn't get nasty or obnoxious or curse someone out. He would just try and fix it. And, you know, that was part of his persona, which is why, which is, which is why I think he impacted so many people that met him because he had that, like he had that aspect of himself, that he was a real guy. And you can't phone that in either. You can't fake that. So, yeah, but, and the voice kind of, like I said, goes with that saying. I mean, prior to me, for, I formed Grim Reaper with another singer back in 79, I think it was. God damn old. But anyway, um, the uh, we were very much, so there were three local bands that really, sort of were big in in our very small local area and by big i mean we were the ones on the on the little circuit and there was a much much more prolific circuit back in those days pubs were pubs would have bands play clubs would have bands play so we were grim reaper steve was in a band called medusa and there was another band called rothschild yeah and what if it stack attack stack attack yeah and they were really really good too they were and Everyone would go, well, weren't you rivals? It's like, no, we supported each other. Like, you know, on the on the See You in Hell video, we borrowed stuff from both Medusa and Rothschild to make that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was just so what happened was, well, actually, what happened was Medusa kind of fragmented because two members went to join Rothschild. And Paul, the old singer, and the original Green Reaper was more Van Halen meets... David uh, meets um, Thin Lizzy because he, he was much more of a Phil Lynott kind of a singer. And not that I, I'm anything, I shouldn't even be in the same sentence as Eddie Van Halen, the late great Edward, but <laughs> th those were our influences. And, you know, Steve was a Medusa. And so once he became free, and then Grim Reaper was on the verge of signing to Heavy Metal Records, which was our first real release, apart from the demos, was we were on an album called Heavy Metal Heroes which is probably has the worst album cover ever made in the history of metal, which is saying, <laughs> which is saying, it looks like it was draw, drawn by a five-year-old blindfolded in the dark. It was really bad. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at fear no evil here. I don't know. And that's hard to beat too. <laughs> uh, that's, well, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of one of our. The, the our, problem is the bar was set with this. That's the problem. Yeah, right? that, that the bar, bar was set. set. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the bar was set really well with that one, actually. And, and I always maintained, by the way, going off, off topic, but, you know, we always branded ourselves the ugliest band in the world. And I, I'm always convinced that the reason See You in Hell remains the best selling of those three albums, of which I'm all, I'm proud of them all is I've always maintained the reason that sold the best is we were smart enough not to put our pictures on the back cover. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, would have, that, that had a negative impact moving forward. You know, what, you know what it is? You guys are like me and Al. We're just regular guys. We're no models or anything. We're just regular guys, right? And, well, speak but, for but, yourself. But, I'm, but, I'm a foot model. <laughs> I'm a but, foot model. But, but I guess back then, right? Yeah. If you weren't like up here in terms of looks and so forth, right? You were considered, you know, you know, not normal in a sense, right? Yeah, you had to. Yeah, it was it was a very, but funny enough, you know, I my favorite bands back in the era were not sort of good looking bands, I guess. You know, with the greatest respect to the guys in Judas Priest, they, you know, Rob is, I think, Mr. Halford's one of the finest singers to ever walk this planet. And yeah. I think Steve belongs in that bracket. But, you know, he wasn't Sebastian Bach, shall we say. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
who was also a great singer, by the way. <laughs> really? And a funny guy. I like Sebastian. Well, but, okay. When you, you know, first... Uh, go ahead. He's in the eye of the beholder, eh? Because in Lemmy's autobiography, he said he finished second at David Coverdale and Sexiest Man Alive one year or so. <laughs> yeah, go figure. Right. Yeah, And, and I'm amazed the blind people knew where to vote. But anyway. <laughs> um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you first heard Steve sing, like, like the first time you go, oh gosh, this is like an A-list singer here. You know, this is, this is not your regular, you know, uh, gruffy new wave of British heavy metal singers. This is, this is the real deal here. Was that, what were your initial thoughts? Well, what's interesting is, and I had this conversation with a friend of mine the other day, is that I was aware of the, you know, I would go and watch Medusa and they were great. And Steve's voice impressed me, but you don't really get, you don't realize how good he is until you're actually standing in a room with him. You're playing the guitar and then he opens that mouth. And the first time he did that, I stopped playing. <laughs> and only and a similar, similar thing happened with a, I'll let something out of the bag now. Hopefully I'm not, um, I'm touching wood here. Hopefully I'm not going to jeopardize it. Um, one of the, um, this is, one of these off this this conversation has already gone so far off on many tangents so i'm going to take you off on another tangent um one of the few good you know once again looking at covid as being the glass as being half full as opposed to half empty one of the blessings covid gave me and i mean this sincerely was it enabled me to do some quarantine jams with steve with um i did it with uh, we we have a mutual friend called steve stein who's a great guitar player great youtuber and him and steve did an album called grimstein yeah. way back when well not way back when maybe about 10 years ago and when covid first hit and the lockdown started um steve stein phoned me up and said hey i'm gonna do a quarantine jam with some session playing friends well he, he He's, he's got a drummer friend who's a session player. He's got a really great bass playing friend who plays in the band Hairball, Brian. And Joel Stephen, that's the drummer who not only plays sessions, but, you know, actually does does like stadium gigs with big name players. He said, would you like to be involved? And I went, I would love to be involved. What's the song? He said, uh, Heaven and Hell. And my brain immediately started to make excuses as to why I couldn't do it because... Ronnie James Dio is, is one of those guys who's up there again. And if it's going to be an okay singer, I, you can't do that. So I was thinking, God, if he tells me someone who I don't think you can match, I'm going to have to be busy that day painting. Or something. <laughs> Gotta um, wash my hair. Baking cookies. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well put, sir. Well put. No, I'm, I'm off to do a modeling gig. Sorry. Can't play it. Yeah. So um, he went, Oh no, it'll be, it'll, it's, he said, Good question. He goes, Steve. I said, Steve, as in Grimmit. He went, yeah, I said, I'm in. Yeah. And Steve crushed it. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it got to like 600,000. Yes, yes, we did. Yeah. Which is quite ridiculous. And then we went on to do, um, Steve was a big Coverdale fan. So we did uh, Still of the Night. Then we did um, Number of the Beast, which was a lot of fun because we got my good friend Courtney from the Iron Maidens Uh played on it as well. And we got Craig Gass, the amazing impersonation uh, comedian, to do the intro. And then the <laughs> last, one, and then the last one we did, and he did it magnificently. And actually, Russ Grimmett, um, on that video, Russ Grimmett, Steve's son, actually did the made the video. Like he actually edited. Yeah, the video. yeah. It was cool. And then we finished with slight with slided in. No, it was no slow and easy. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 I get White Snake confused because of all the double entendres they have. But yeah, it was slow and easy versus slide it in. And um, my my grand plan was to, once COVID was finally over and done with, which sadly it's still not over and done with, even though it's not in the news anymore, um, I wanted to finish it off with See You in Hell. Um, we never got a chance to do that, unfortunately. So... I was talking to Steve Stein after I heard the dreadful news and I didn't, and I didn't post anything until I heard it from like the family, like Millie and Russ. I, mm-hmm. I, I, there's so much fake news. I remember years ago, some idiot posted that uh, Phil Campbell had passed and he was, he was 
he was actually in Brazil or somewhere, and that his family found out via some idiot's post, and it, and he didn't, and he hadn't passed. It was false news, but he broke, he ruined the family's life for God knows how many hours until it was proven otherwise. And so I'm very aware of irresponsible posting. So once it was confirmed, that then I sort of crafted my sort of. I, I guess for once for a better word, my eulogy to Steve, or at least my first one. And then I was speaking to Steve Stein that evening and we were talking about stuff we could do to help the family, you know, because as you correctly pointed out, and for those listening, any, even if it's 50 cents, please throw something in the GoFundMe because a funeral is extremely, extremely expensive. And as you've, as Jimmy correctly pointed out, there will be an aftermath. And, um, you know, Steve, we never made any money from Grim from from Grim Reaper. We got to tour America three times. We got to do things I never thought we'd do. And I view that as my payment, you know, being on MTV, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, this I, I haven't bought anything from funds from Grim Reaper, but I had an amazing time, had the time of my life. Um, but to quote uh, Hunter S. Thompson, the late great, you know, Gonzo journalist. I think his my favorite quote of his many great quotes was, I think it goes something like, "The music industry is a shallow plastic trench where thieves and dogs roam free, and good men die like dogs." <laughs> there's also a neg- there's also a negative side, <laughs> which is perfect. Actually, thieves and pimps. He said, "Thieves and pimps thieves run and free." Pimps. And good men die like dogs, dot, dot, dot. There's also a negative side. And that sums up the industry. You know, everyone from Elton John down, who's one of the richest guys on the planet, was ripped off blind by the industry. But that's just what it is. But what I'm trying to say here is that everyone, might, they might look at Spotify and go, wow, Grim Reaper got a million streams of such and such. Me and Steve haven't seen a penny from that yet. So, and that's going to be about 30 cents, I think. All I right. Think. So, so so Steve the- told uh, me and Alan... Actually, I want to state this again. The link to the GoFundMe, which was not put up by the Grimmett family, yes. is is by friends, concerned friends who want to help out because Millie's got way too many bills and she wants to also make sure that this is streamed and he's got the right send-off. It's in the link of this video. So just click on that. Give what you can. Like Nick said, just give what you can. That's all we ask for, you know. And hey, it's the 31st anniversary of, of Rocky the House, so share that with with the link in case you've got friends who, how dare they, aren't watching this. So, Yes. <laughs> so, um, there's just so many questions. The money aspect. So Steve told me and Alan a few times yeah. that there was funds, there was money sitting somewhere frozen but he could not get access to this money until the court cases were resolved. He also told us that the music guild set them in the UK, set them up with lawyers to sort of go after that money that was never paid out to you guys. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I could. Well, I'll, 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 I'll just finish the initial thing. Sorry. Yes. So, yeah, go so, so going back to the sea and health thing. So I, I, I said to, you know, myself and Steve Stein were talking about that. And Steve said it would be kind of cool if we could do that and maybe bolster the, like the GoFundMe and stuff, which, which we knew was going to happen because of concerned friends. And um, once again, the problem arose of who do we get to sing it? And I, I had three choices. And my first choice was because he'd done stuff with Steve recently. Like it, that just prior to COVID, he did something with Steve. He has a very similar voice and said it was recent, not sort of 30 years ago. And I think that's kind of important. And the other reason is the first time I heard this man open his voice on a stage when I was playing guitar, I did the exact same thing I told you about when I was playing with when Steve opened his mouth. I stopped playing. Wow. And, and at the risk of name dropping, which I'm now going to shamelessly do. <laughs> It was, I think the, it might've been 2000, maybe 2010 or two or a little bit earlier. We did a dime, we did a dime bash actually at, well, we've, we've always done the dime bash at Nam, but we did one in the Hilton hotel and I turned up early for sound check and it was myself, um, 
Jason Bittner was from Shadows Fall now and Overkill was playing drums. Um, on guitar was this little guy with a goatee, Scott Ian or something from <laughs> yeah, yeah. amazing guy, amazing player. Who is a Scott Ian fella? Yeah, some <laughs> from, from some band called Arctic or something. Um, <laughs> Ajax. And, um, yeah, and yeah, Amtrak, yeah, yeah, from the train band. And the other one, and the bass player, may he also rest in peace, was Paul Gray from Slipknot. And we were playing, I think it was a Kiss song or something. And then Ripper showed up and grabbed the mic and started singing. And I stopped playing, and I'm pretty sure Scott did as well, because it was like, holy mother of, where did that come from? <laughs> so I phoned up. I, I contacted Ripper and said, hey, you know, we want to do this as a tribute and hopefully to help raise funds and awareness because a lot of, there's so much white noise in, on social media right now. Stuff gets lost really quickly. And Ripper, God bless him, has agreed. Nick? Sent it to him. Okay, so. we, you just froze oh, we there just for froze a second. Up a little bit. So, you so want to just Ripper backtrack agreed? 20 seconds. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Ripper said yes, and um, we've already I've already recorded my parts. We've dropped the song down to E flat, and myself, Steve, and the drummer have already recorded their parts. Brian's on tour with uh, Hairball. He'll get back, and I believe once again, without trying to, really, um, Russ is going to edit the video. So we, we'll we'll do that obviously post funeral, but just to keep the to keep the celebration of life moving forward. And I think that's really important now to to celebrate the life yes it is sad it's extremely sad we're all grieving but i'm also grateful and this might sound like an oxymoron but i'm grateful that i'm sad because if i wasn't it meant i didn't i never knew steve or worked with him and, and that to me is an un unacceptable alternative so and, and we've had ripper on the show and you're talking about a fantastic voice but very similar in steve very down to earth a very uh, you know, just loves the loves music. I mean, he he'll play anywhere, anytime, and uh, he's just a great guy as well, Ripper. Oh no, yeah. I, like I, Nick, I, Nick, just I just pause him. right there. Pause right there. Uh, the Dillager Compound said, "I made a donation. I hope this helps." So, if anybody makes a donation, I'll read their name. Just Thank you. just to be cool, right? Go ahead, Nick. Apologies. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, I agree. Like the last time Ripper came through Fort Wayne, I got up and I played. What did we play? I think we played metal. Was it? Uh, no, we played Grinder. Like I, I joined his band, mm. Grinder, and his voice. It's just like like to play a song like that with a voice like that behind you. <laughs> it's like you know one of my one of my bucket list. One of my favorite. Going back to Anthrax, one of my favorite Anthrax songs is Madhouse. And Joey invited me to play two shows opening for Twisted Sister with his band when he wasn't in Anthrax. And we played a bunch of Anthrax songs, but one of them was Madhouse. And to play that riff and then hear that voice come in, the same kind of thing, goosebumpy stuff. But anyway, so yeah, getting back to the to the money stuff, trying to make a very long and messy story short and not too messy. We Grim Reaper won a couple of Battle of the Bands competitions. We got we got some serious interest, but the majors weren't interested in in metal bands in England, really. They'd already got Iron Maiden and Saxon, yada, yada. And Diamond Head, they just signed Diamond Head. So we ended up signing a deal with a company called Ebony. And See You in Hell was recorded in two and a half days in what you guys would call welfare housing. It's called a council house in, in England, but it was literally in Hull, which I think would see you in Hull, we always often used to say. <laughs> Freaking like a, a poor town is the semi-detached, which means his his neighbors and him shared the same wall. His stu his his desk was in the kit, what was effectively the kitchen, and we recorded in the front room the team. Yeah, and we literally like bass, drums, and first guitar, because I doubled all the guitars, they were recorded live. So we literally got all of so we got bass, drums, and guitar. And most of the second guitar is done in day one. And then day two was guitar solos and vocals. Number three was just making sure we had, day two and a half was making sure we hadn't missed anything. And that was it. And the reason we could do that is we'd been playing the damn stuff for two years. And if we couldn't go in and play it right off the bat, then we probably shouldn't have been there. But anyway, long story short, we were just happy to have a record out. Then RCA got interested. And that's when things started to slowly but surely you started to go, what's going on here financially? Because 
by the time we got to Rock You to Hell, which we actually started recording with this clan, but 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 never finished it, he'd gone literally, and I'm not I'm not kidding. He went from a from this council house, which was welfare housing, to literally a castle in the country, <laughs> like a mansion by a self standing monolith of a place. And it's like, and he had a band called Shy, who were really good, whose vocalist also sadly passed away, Tony. And he had a couple of other bands, but I think we were the one that made him the most money. And it's like, I'm pretty sure he didn't, um, it wasn't through his entrepreneurial skills. So long story short, our, our management and RCA were looking at this guy going, there's something you're not, you should not be where you are financially. So they went, they, what happened was when, when Rocky to hell was about to, after he sent the first tapes of Rocky to hell back to RCA an advance went to him of which we were supposed to get a percentage. And we never had a percentage prior to that. They waited 30 days until after we were supposed to get that. And then management went, you're in breach of contract. You're out of here. And this is where, this is where it gets interesting and quite sad as well in, a, in, so this guy was so stupid, he decided, so we signed directly to RCA America. He decided, so, and then they said, we're going to screw these tapes. They're not, they're not as good as they should be. We're going to put you with Max Norman. I was like, what? I'm going to record with the guy who did some of my favorite albums, including, you know, the two Aussie albums. Yeah. So, you know, because up until then, I was effectively, eff effectively the producer. Daryl Johnson just hit record and mixed. He didn't produce anything. All the arrangements were mine. And also Steve's, obviously, with backing vocals and stuff. So it was interesting after two albums to go in a studio with Max and have him going, yeah, that's really good, but change this, this, and this. And I had this devil and angel, on the, you know, like the Tom and Jerry thing. The devil was <laughs> going, tell this short guy to F off. And the, the, the angel was going... It's Max Norman, you moron. Max Norman. Listen to him. <laughs> Go back, listen to, look at, look at your favorite albums. Max Norman is the boss. Oh, yeah, oh, pause, so. pause right there. Okay, Marcy Douglas, he's making a donation. And every Thank time there's a donation, you. I'll just pause you. And I just want to be polite here. Uh, and, you know, check out her new CD as well. Okay, Thanks. go ahead. So, yeah. So, anyway, so, so we get to record an album that I think did the band justice in terms of what we were capable of, because Max Norman is, as you said, the man, Alan. And um, so we, but we basically, we did that. We did the tour with Armored Saint and Halloween. Mm -hmm. And then it was okay back and make another record. And then Daryl Johnson sued us. It took him a, a, like a year to sue us. So he decided to take out a counter lawsuit against the breach of contract. So he sued the band uh, but this guy was so stupid, he sued the wrong RCA. <laughs> he sued, and I'm not going to mention the guy's name because uh, yeah, we'll just. I think we should, but anyway, <laughs> <We're just laughs> ass hat. Like, like I hate it when someone does something obnoxious and you know his name. It's like I don't care to know the name of this person, but I'll just say he's an asshole. Excuse my French, but it's so okay. so he sued RCA England. So he spent a bunch of money getting a lawyer to sue RC England. And RC England, they told they called me up as like the our our A and R person was literally laughing. She goes, she goes, I wish I could have been there for the call because the guy called him and said, Hi, I'm legal counsel for RCA. And he goes, Yeah, glad to hear from, saw you see you in court. He goes, No, you won't. He goes, Why not? He goes, You sued the wrong RCA, you idiot. <laughs> it's RCA USA. And he said, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and the guy said, and just so you know, just so you're aware, you can't just take white out and get rid of K and put SA because it's a That's completely right. different That's legal right. system. And he couldn't afford to sign. He couldn't afford to resue un, under the American situation. So we just ended up landlocked in this ridiculous lawsuit, which is why and we were in such a bad financial state. We actually got, you know, free legal counsel. And Anyway, oh, it, it go, the story goes on and on and on. It, it eventually split the band because, because we literally were landlocked. And Steve got offered the Onslaught gig. We tried to use it as a lever, and RCA said, you know what, Nick? We think Grim Reaper's done. We just want to keep you. And this is a great gig for Steve. So Steve went to Onslaught, and I went to America. But that's Pause right there. Pause right there. Scott Britton says, I just 
donated. He says he'll give what he can. Proceed. God bless you, Scott. God bless you. So anyway, so what happened was, so I, so I, so me and Steve parted on the best. Of, you know, I love Steve to death, but we both, we both knew we could either he could go on with onslaught who had who on paper were going to be the next big thing and i i, I went to watch a rehearsal well, i went to watch them rehearse it was amazing i went to see them record in uh, in new york because they recorded while i was there mm -hmm. so we agreed that you know the best thing to do as much as it broke our hearts grim reaper at least had to go on hold if not like on temporary hold he'd go to onslaught i'd go with rca so anyway while i was in america I got a call from someone. They said, look, we know you can't, because of the legal stuff, you can't um, be directly involved, but will you let us know everything you can about the situation with Ebony Records? And it was actually someone from, he said, you will not be mentioned. We will not reference you at all. But, you know, what What can you tell us? And it was, it was there was a, a big TV expose TV show like did a, a 60 minutes on this guy as a thief basically like like they exposed him on national tv and he went bankrupt within two weeks because wow. all, all the people he was doing business with went you know what we're out no we're not distributing your stuff no you're not doing this no your credit no you don't have credit and i think he lost the castle i don't really care yeah <laughs> And his wife, then his wife, had, who was who was who was who was implicit throughout it, you know, she was his evil twin, had the audacity to call me. She goes, "I'm I'm trying to sue Daryl for, for um, I'm suing for divorce. I need your help." And it was like, "I'm giving you no help because you're yeah. part of it. Can you make him out to be a bad person? You mean like you were?" So and, <laughs> yeah. so That's the other, karma. Yeah, yeah, karma's a bitch. And to yeah. quote, and to quote. Um, to quote bring me the horizons amazing lyricist and it has no deadline oh uh, yeah yeah because it doesn't but anyway so yeah so he so there's a bunch of money there but where that money if that money still exists i don't know because when someone goes bankrupt the banks get first dibs yeah i mean you know it's an iconic album to see you in hell is it any truth you know the council i read the story about the the council flat where you recorded but you also had to stop by like five o'clock in the afternoon, because that's when all the neighbors would come home from yeah. work, right? Yeah, which is which is which is why it took two and a half days as opposed to a day. Of what? <laughs> yeah, no. It's but 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 like Steve told us, this was rehearsed. I mean, it wasn't like okay, guys, let's write songs in one day. These are the songs were down, right? The yeah, songs yeah. were down. You're just going to record them, like our did. And the funny thing was too is that the album ended up being a lot like we never played the songs that fast, but everyone just you know you like, you get that red light fever. It's, oh Christ, we're recording! So we well, wait a second. The drumming. I want to know about the timing on the drumming. This, which is iconic in itself, right? It's some sometimes it speeds up a little bit. Sometimes it goes slow a bit. Yeah, that was that was that, that was that was just what we were, you know. Rock you and know, roll. Yeah. No. Well, the funny thing is, it's sort of like like we live in a day and age now where everything is gridded. Everyone's got Pro Tools or Garage Band, and they're looking at this damn grid. But if you listen to the iconic records, not that I'm saying we we like see when hell's iconic, but you imagine. But but if you listen to Led Zeppelin, or you listen to that first Guns and you listen to Appetite of Destruction, or for Destruction rather, you listen to to the Rolling Stones, the 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 tempo does this and it, it also it, it'll push in places pull back in places and it was and the rest of the bands like that's just how we played the song it's okay it's coming to a chorus ramp it up then slow it down and i've i've heard people try and like 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 they tried to uh what do they call it like they can, like they can actually auto correct stuff. If you auto correct Led Zeppelin's looseness, it becomes garbage relatively. Yeah, I agree. Like to me, that's on. rock and roll. No, that's it's organic. It's, it's got to be yeah. organic, and that's what I. And that's part of the charm of this album. It's the organic sounding nature of it. You know, great songs organically sounding nature. Uh, thank you. And it's, and it, yeah, so it wasn't quantized was the word I was looking for. You can mm. not press a button, but I mean, were, this is this this is how. This is how rock and roll it was. Though I remember on one song, I went, I kind of screwed up that chord, and the the mix, the producer went, oh, I'll just pull it back for that part. Don't worry about it. Yeah. 
So it didn't even redo stuff. And he, the only punching he could do was punching a clock. He didn't know how to punch it in and out. So Klaus, Klaus Isaacson says donated. So thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you, Klaus. But yeah. I thought, I thought when we spoke to Steve, he mentioned that there was like a, maybe a partial fourth album that was in a can mm. somewhere. But from what you're describing, I don't, I don't know if there is. The secret yeah, fourth did, album. No, we we actually wrote the we actually did some stuff like we did a bunch of demos for 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 RCA, and I wanted to call the album "Nothing Whatsoever to Do with Hell" just because. Yeah, <laughs> kind of been done. <laughs> yeah, it's been done, but yeah. So the answer is like, yeah, yeah. We did a bunch of stuff, and I think someone, some one of these shites, they got someone got a copy of a copy of a copy and tried to put it out, but yeah, we did. There were like I think there were five or six songs Steve and myself penned. We also did two covers. We did um, we you know because Arcee was saying we need something for the radio, and I was like Cold Sweat by Thin Lizzy. So we did, oh yeah, which is a great song. And I think and we also did Call Me by Diamond Head. Mm. But you know I I I still have them. I still have the eight track. Well, a friend of friend of mine lent me one of the cheap eight track um, reel to reel machines and i've st i've still got the the master tapes but i don't think you can find a machine that would play that stuff but <laughs> you know so it's like it, it lurks but it was like it was never finished it was it and you know people ask me you know do you feel bad about grim reaper you know like the like the nick bocott grim reaper nick bocott steve grimmett form of of grim reaper finishing where it finishing and yeah i am saddened but one of my favorite interviews ever was because I, I became a journalist. Well, I became a journalist during Grim Reaper. And I knew so this is not one of your favorite interviews. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. One of, one, <laughs> no, no, one, one, one of my favorite interviews, one of my favorite quotes with like, like, like past with, interviews. Yeah. yeah past interviews was with, with, with one of my heroes, Michael Schenker. And I was mm. interviewing him for Circus Magazine because I, I did the guitar column for like yes. six years. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I, yeah now was, that you bring it up, I remember, yeah. Yeah, which is a lot of fun because, you know, it was like, okay, let me get this straight. You'll, you you want me to talk to someone I like and you'll pay me for it. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, like, I'll do Can it. Can do. And, I'll, and I'll that's what we paid. do minus the pay business. <laughs> yeah, the checks won't yeah. bounce. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Although Circus's checks towards the end did start bouncing, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gets paid. No. Um, but so I remember asking Michael, you know, because he was, if you look at Michael Schenker's career, he was in UFO for a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. And he was a kid. I think he was 17 when he did Rock Bottom in the studio, something like that. And so this was in, you know, M M he'd made, you know, maybe seven or eight MSG albums by the time I interviewed him, which would have been the mid, probably the mid 90s. No, yeah, mid ninety ish. So I said, I said, Michael. So, um, looking back, why do you think your 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 relatively short life with um, UFO? Why those records are held in such reverence? And is it okay if I if I if I use bad language on this show, or would you rather not? No, it's fine. It's fine. Go, no, ahead. Okay, good. Go ahead. As long as it doesn't get too crazy, I guess. No, he said. Uh, <laughs> Michael's, and I'll never forget it because because you had that act, you you had you had his wonderful German you know his Teutonic accent which 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 I cannot impersonate but I'll, oh I can yeah so, <laughs> so, so his answer was so you know so the question was once again why do you think those relatively few that short amount of time and those relatively few albums are held with such esteem and are deemed iconic today and he said his answer was it was because we never got the chance to make the record that everyone went, why the fuck did you make that piece of shit? No. <laughs> he got in and he got out. Yeah, he was the like, quality well, was good. Yeah, and, and, and that eventually happens to every band where you go. I, I just hope you didn't ask him about his brother because me and Alan have asked him about his brother and just goes off on all kinds of tangents. Oh, no, you I love Michael that. Shaker. Yeah, there, 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 there are certain things you can't ask Michael, but yeah, what a great guitar player. But anyway, so, so I'm kind of, I'm, even though it was only three albums that for, for whatever reason, and if you and if you'd have told me in 1983, which was when when Steve and myself wrote See You in Hell, that you know almost 40 years later, kids who weren't even born would have patches of that on their jackets. Crazy. I would, I would have told you, I would have driven you to rehab myself, to be honest with you. <laughs>
Well, just let don't. me ask you this. The iconic scream at the end of the song, See You in Hell, which is the money, that's the money, that's the money note, we'll say, right? right? When you first heard that, you go, oh my God, what is going on here? I mean, what were your thoughts? Well, it's just, that was, that's what Steve was capable of. I don't know if he could circular breathe or not, but yeah, he could, he could hold those notes. And the, you know, the funny thing is with, 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 with someone like Steve is that he, he's the same as Rob Halford in a way that it's that you think, yeah, that probably took 15 hours in the studio. Then he'll do it live consistently. Not, not one time, but every night. And that's what gets. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't trained. That's what he told me. He wasn't oh. like a, maybe he had some lessons. I'm not sure, but he was not a trained singer. He just sang. Well, the great thing is you could tell, you know, that they say you, we were, we were likening to him to like Ripper. And if you listen to like, there are certain, there are two ways of getting high. One is to do the, um, Oh, what's his name? Um, Tis I Justin Hawkins from the, you know, like you can do the falsetto darkness kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that guy killed it at um, the Dave Grohl, the, the Foo Fighters, Taylor Hawkins tribute, by the way, I thought he was magnificent. But but yeah, he's you can either you know like the falsetto thing, or it comes mm -hmm. from deep within. And the singers I like, like the um, like the Ronnie James Dio's, the the Rob Halfords, the David Waynes, may he rest in peace. The, yes, like like yes. the Joey Belladonnas of this world and the Steve Grimmits. It comes and and obviously Ripper, it's coming from the diaphragm. And it's yeah. just this huge, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, you can seismographic proportions in terms of the power. It's not the note, it's the power be behind the note that gives it that, the, the balls, I guess. Well, Todd LaTorre, who was on our show that we did with Millie a few, a week ago, I guess, he said it best, you know, a great singer is, you know, when you have the chest voice and the head voice and you're not, you don't notice the transition. No. Right. And it's because the chest voice is, or the head voice is just as powerful as the chest voice. Yeah. And that's what you're, you're alluding to. Yeah. I mean, I think, but like basically like it came from within, like, yeah. it, like, like, like to me, it's, it's, it's heart and hands. You know, it's it, like, it's like, it's, it's, it's heart and head. And then just his larynx, but also the lungs. Yeah. 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 And you know, we met Steve when he was going with uh, Steve Grimm at uh, Grim Reaper. And what I take about from that at that time is the great friendship between you and Steve, because it's like, Steve, have at it. You know, it was all, everything's always, always amicable, it seemed, between you and Steve. I'm not using Grim Reaper. Get out there and keep the songs alive. And that's, that's the way I remember uh, it at that time. Yeah, well, the, I mean, that, that was our, our agreement was sort of, if I ever do something, if I ever did a Grim Reaper thing, which I probably wouldn't, I would call it Nick, Bo unless he was to sing, it would be Nick Bocott's Grim Reaper. And he went, yeah, I'll, I'm going to do the same. And so, but, you know, and, and thankfully there were several occasions uh, we did Sweden rock. We did a big, we headlined a festival in Chicago, played Arizona. We played Fort Wayne actually, and also played the, the whiskey. Like we headlined the whiskey, which was great because when we came to LA, that was one of my bucket list gigs. I wanted to play the whiskey go go, but it's like, no, you can't play there. Like you're too big. It's like, come on. But so anyway, we, we went years back, years, years later, and it was just Grim Reaper. Did you ever like have that urge to say, you know what? I call up Steve and say, you know, Steve, let's just do this. Let's just do one last tour as Grim Reaper, you and me. Let's go for it. You know, well, what we, what I, what I did, and I think there's actually something on the, I, it's someone filmed it and it's, it's somewhere out there, out there on the internet after Steve lost his voice, after, after Steve lost his leg, I actually went on, I went on public record saying, Hey, let's do the album that, that, that never was. And Steve, between us and everyone else listening, it was just, just between the three of us, whoever else is listening. Just us. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, Steve wanted to do it too, but he couldn't because of the because of the record contract he currently was 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 oh, on. Okay. And I and I, and I and I and I and I got that. It's a shame, but I get it. You know, it's like he he he'd made an agreement with with the company, so that was deemed never to be. But so so I just to clarify, so the fourth Grim Reaper album, you wanted to finish with Steve. Is that it? Yeah, I would like. I I, I wanted to do. I, I wouldn't do it with any other singer. I mean, is is it repairable? Is there like did with the digital world that you can just go in whatever songs you have from that fourth Grim Reaper album, and you know, using today's technology, 
the, uh, the answer is uh, that's something I, I I was actually thinking about that that the other day, just seeing if I could find if I could get a if I if I could find someone who had that machine. I think it was so. Four, what kind of machine is it? Is it a four and a three four quarter? It was a it was a Fostec eight track. I think it was called the A eight. So it, so it put eight tracks on a relatively thin piece of tape. So so you'd need the heads like like you'd need the correct heads. But I figured if if we could pull if we could pull Steve's vocal off it, we could reverse engineer everything. So in other words, if somebody anybody out there, there if any, yeah, <laughs> somebody there have must Fostec. have it, is was it real to real or was it cassette? No, it was real to real. So it was it was se it was semi professional. It was really cool, actually. It was a great machine, actually. Well, I had a Fostex four track, but it was a cassette one. It was, right? Uh, yeah, they actually, yeah, yeah, they actually took out. They actually took it to eight track, but it but yeah. it but it was on quarter inch as opposed to half inch. If memory serves me correctly, okay. so they they managed to get eight. They managed to get eight tracks on a quarter inch. In fact, while we're doing this, yeah, I think it was called the Fostex Fostex A eight. So if anyone's got one of those, yeah. Please see me. Nick or reach just send, out to me, Nick. send me and reach out to us or on Nick behalf of and, Grim Reaper fans everywhere. Please contact Nick. We will put you in the credits of the fourth album. Oh, not in hell. Yeah, in, not yeah. in hell. This is nothing to do with hell. Yeah, nothing whatsoever. I think was the, <laughs> was the what about I mean, okay, so you what about touring? Where was that ever sort of on the table, you know, saying to Steve? I know there was one offs here and there, but was there ever um, well, there were, we we were actually talking about on the on the, on his next on the next run, which which he which he kind of had scheduled out, mm -hmm. and then COVID hit and stopped everything. I think I was going to try and join join the band for like five or six of the shows in succession, so it became like a tour within a tour. Because I I, I'm, I was friends with all of his like his bandmates, like his like his bass player and 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 guitar player and Steve Grimmitz. Um, Grim Reaper. Grim Reaper. Yeah, it's a mouthful. Yes, yeah. I know. SG's GR. Um, Actually, strange enough, this says Steve Grimmitz, Grim Reaper. If you, yeah. if you look carefully, yeah. Yes. No, I can see it. But the and thanks for wearing that, by the way. The the the, the check is in the mail. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After the lawyers uh, kind of find the money, right? <laughs> yeah. After the lawyers, yeah. Hold up, listen to this. Oh, yeah, Millie Grimmett saying, Nick, we'll talk. I have a cunning plan about album number four. So, ooh, something's going on. Something's brewing. Something's okay, brewing. good. Well, I know All Steve right, is stuff. working on something. So, yeah, a cunning plan. That sounds like something right out of Black Hatter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're listening to this, Millie, God bless you. And hey, hang in there, young lady. Yeah, she's young watching. Woman. She, she, uh, she, you know, made a wonderful statement on a last show we did. And anything you guys out there can do to support her and her family, you know, uh, for the funeral and after the funeral, again, I will say it again. The link is in the video description. Please help them out. You know? Yeah. So Millie to be continued now, now I'm kind of intrigued, but now what, what was I, what was I going to say? So, yeah, yeah. So we were talking about playing and stuff. So Steve's, as you probably know, Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper was was going to play was going to be the headliner of the night before the wonderfully named and wonderfully um, curated Keep It Keep It True yes. festival in Germany. It looks like I'm flying out to play that show with 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 the band, and we've got some special guest vocalists, to Great. Do that, which will be a wonderful tribute. And the, and and the organizers, Oliver, I don't know if he's listening to this, but he don't... is. Oliver says, "Hey Nick, see you in a few weeks." I just saw his message. But Oliver, Oliver from amazing. Keep it true. Thank you, Oliver, for making that happen. That's truly a you know, yeah, and they and and they've made commemorative badges, which is mm -hmm. just wonderful, just wonderful, wonderful. And it's you know, I I know Steve sitting up there with. Sadly, too many of my friends have passed. He's probably sitting up, up there with dime bag right now, having a black tooth going, yeah, wear the badge, damn it. <laughs> get, get your pull. But that, that will be dime. But but yeah, it's um, you know, and the and, and I think I think it's behooven upon us to like to keep that fire burning because like like that voice is timeless in my humble opinion. As is his, as is Steve's legacy, and I, I'm like I said, I'm extremely proud of those albums. The fact I, you know, I teach at Sweetwater now, yeah, and 
I signed I signed an album just like literally on Friday when my pupils brought it in, and he's like sixteen for God's sake. So he was he was born twenty years after that, and I'll never, I'll never forget like like when we played the first big show. We well the the Chicago show was great, but when we played Sweden Rock, there was a signing session afterwards, and I would say ninety five percent of those who queued up and there were shockingly large amounts of people god bless them um and, and they all had vinyl or cds but most of them had vinyl they were um they were all born way after the after that the albums from which those songs were called were recorded so that's that's the beauty of metal in my humble opinion that's that's why i, I think me heavy metal isn't like it's not a fad it's not a this is nice wasn't it to quote lemmy one of my favorite lemmy quotes um, it's a lifestyle, and if you're into heavy metal, it's a, it's 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 for life. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we, just we, so you we know, Nick, me, agree with that. That's yeah. so me and Alan, you know, now we're talking about 11, 12 years ago. Like our objective when we started this a long time ago was yeah. to make sure that the Grimmits and the Bocots and the Grim Reapers and the Saxons, you know, they had a voice to sort of express themselves about their new music or their old music and sort of keep it going, keep it the legacy going. And that's sort of the goal of the metal voice from day one. I can there. Uh, but and, and also, you know, also to get the younger generations to, to know a lot of these great bands that uh, unfortunately it took, you know, some, for some fans, it took Steve's passing for them to go back and re revisit <laughs> all these albums. Yeah. So, uh, oh, sometimes, you know, it, it goes, but it's, you know, it's funny you bring it up. It's because, you know, I was fortunate enough to be extremely close with with the late great Dimebag, and yeah. and his 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 better half Rita's done an amazing job in like maintain making sure his shadow has, hasn't only endured but has become bigger. If anything, there's been a lot of kerfuffle about the the Pantera reunion or the T Pantera celebration, and from from I've been asked about it a lot because I was fortunate enough to be good friends with both Vinny and Dime, and um, the thing is, there's a, there's a whole generation of people that love Pantera, and I see it li literally on a daily basis because I teach Pantera a lot. Mm -hmm. There are kids that were born after the band was done that have never seen it, and when it comes to the when when it comes to the choices, the the thing about Pantera is it was a family vibe. That's what I loved about working with Dime so much, becoming so close with. You can probably see the discs behind me, right. so, but it you became part of a family. And it's still a family. That family endures. Like like whenever I see Grady Champion or Reader or or Cat or Wires, it's like or, or Bobby Tongs. It's like time ceases to ex you 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 forget how long has passed because it's like you were yeah. with yesterday. And the one thing I can say with regards Zach and Charlie Benante is Charlie Benante not only is an amazing drummer and a great riff writer too. Like Charlie's a damn yeah, 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 player. Yeah. Charlie's written a lot of the riffs for Anthrax that people aren't even aware of, and he can play a mean guitar. He was close with both brothers, especially close with Dime, and Zach and and Dime were like brothers. There was a brotherhood there. There was a mutual respect. I was involved in that classic um, in the in the Guitar World cover story with Zach and um, Dime on the cover from start through finish. It, well, that's one of the favorite couple of days of my life, even though it's a blurry memory because we drank enough to kill a small <laughs> country. But there was a there was a genu genuine there was a genuine camaraderie and mutual respect that's timeless, which is why I know Daryl and I know Daryl and Vinny are up there smiling because it will give kids who've never had a chance, you know, Rex and Rex and Philip are still around. They're going to go out there and do the best thing they possibly can. And the one thing Zach Wilde will bring to the table, even though this is off topic, is 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 he will bring the the character energy that Dime had, which was an important part of the Pantera thing. It's not just the notes; it's the attitude with which they were played. And that was one of the reasons I love playing with Steve is that he wasn't phoning it in ever. Yeah, he meant every single word, be it a scream or not. And that's why I think his 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 music, you know, his his voice will remain um, 
held in such high regard because you can tell there was a genuine passion there. Like it came from within, it came from the heart. It wasn't like, oh, this is the line, let me sing it like this. It's like, no, this his his heart was telling him how to sing it. I think Rock You to Hell, like See You in Hell is, of course, we'll call it, consider it the, the classic of all classics, right? Well, thank but, you, sir. Once again, check but, it, Neil. But, but Rock You to Hell in. will be, that's another level Rock You to Hell, I, I find, is especially music wise. I don't think it was appreciated enough at the time, even though it did, you know, sell, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, did, it did pretty good. This album will be appreciated more as the years go by and the decades pass. Just the vocal, just everything about this album is so, it's like an underrated gem. That's what I'm trying to say. No, when you listen to his vocal ability, his singing on this album is just off the charts. I mean, this is a complete A-list singer. This is not, this is, you're talking about like, like you said before, this is like the Ronnie James Dio level. You're talking about, Rob Halford level. You're talking about Bruce Dickinson level. Steve was up there. Yeah, no, Steve. I mean, I, I've always said, I've said this. I said this when he joined Onslaught. Steve, in my opinion, is one of the top three or four vocalists to come out of England ever in the, in the rock field. Yeah. Because he would, and you know, and it took, you know, that was the great thing. I'm, I'm really thankful that you know the, the all of the bad that came from the Ebony lawsuit, the good that came of it. <clears throat> is the fact we got the chance to record with Max Norman and Max Norman masterfully pulled the best out of Steve at the time. And also he pulled the best out of the whole band. It was a, it was a whole st- Max's recording psychology was brilliant. Well, yeah. and Nick, I got to say that opening guitar solo to wasted love still blows my head apart. Every time I listen to it, how many years, 30, 31 years later. So you had a great, Great part of that success as well, obviously. Oh, thank you. Thank, yeah, the, the 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 irony of that wasted love is is that was actually written by myself and the and the old singer Steve uh, Paul. Oh. In fact, it was actually written after he'd left Grim Reaper. We, even though he didn't turn up for a signing, which I thanked him for immensely after said, "Hey, you know, I'd hated you for a couple of weeks, but thank you for not showing up," <laughs> because because I would end up with you know we'd we'd have done an album with an even worse label than and. Than, um, Ebony. Yeah, they were, the, the re- I've got to tell you a story because it's like the, the, the like heavy metal records. It was run by a guy called Paul Birch, and and he ran it from his house, but he was allergic to birch trees, and that you can't, <laughs> you just can't make that stuff up. <laughs> and and I remember going going there when 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 he showed the when he showed us the album cover like the, 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 the he didn't he didn't like our humor it's like cool what so did the kid who won this elementary school art competition what did he get or what did she get for drawing this and they were like that's not funny I said, look at it it's awful you know what and me and Alan talk about this a lot and I'm just gonna bring it up okay. Like when you go, Alan, you're frozen, by the way. Yeah, he froze. Yeah. Hang on. Let me just see what's going on here. Hold on. You might just drop. I think he's like in mid laugh. Oops, wrong one. Here we go. There we go. It's a good pitch to be frozen on. Maybe. Okay, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to. I'm just going to pause and wait till Alan comes back. And I'll just put a picture of you and Steve in the meantime, and we'll just talk from an audio perspective. I'm just going to grab Alan back. He lost him, him and I'll text him, okay? Hang on. You got to love technology. No, this is this is real time, folks. This is live. No. This is no. just as like the first album. Yeah, no edits. This is an, so we're, we're recording in a welfare house. <laughs> Jimmy's in the kitchen. I'm in the front room. <laughs> Alan must have so so what happens is when, when somebody drops off, it kind of ruins my overlay. I have like an overlay uh, right. you know, with the logo and all that stuff. So I have to sort of regroup. Uh, but once I see Alan jump back on and we'll talk about when you get back, sort of the ev- evolution of album covers, how we went from like a complete masterpiece of, you know, album artwork to sort of like, not to say they're terrible, but, you know, sort of, you're going from the best to sort of you know less, right? Right. Yeah. Well, it's it's that's the trouble with. Yeah, I think you know inadvertently by accident that that first album cover raised the bar really high. That's it. That's the problem, right? That was the problem. 
you know, you're going from the greatest album cover to, but I mean, what did you think of, you know, the next two, uh, the next two album covers? Well, funny enough that the guy who did the, 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 the guy who did the second album was a, a very talented drummer friend of mine. The third album cover was done by Gary Sharp, who's now no longer with us anymore, sadly. Mm -hmm. Gary did the first album cover as well. Okay, yeah. So yeah. it was just, I mean, but the, the one of the- Were you a little disappointed? That's what I'm trying to say. Were you a little disappointed? In the, or you said, yeah, it's not too bad. No, it's 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 like you know, twenty twenty hindsight. You know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, as they say. No, I I still like them for what they are. But that first one, you can't touch it. It's kind of like, it's like one of those album covers. It's it's kind of like Sonic Temple by the Cult. Not the Str people. strange enough, and you know, we've talked about this. I bought this album. I believe I saw it in some magazine. I had no idea what the music sounded like. And, you know, as a young guy who's like 16 years old or 15 years old, I was just completely blown away when it was released. And I bought it solely on the image. Well, that right? was, I mean, that was the whole thing. That's one of the things. It's funny that uh, someone else, I've been told that by a lot of people, the most impressed, the one that blew me away the most, just because of what a nice person he is and how genuine he is, was Dave Grohl. Mm-hmm. Like the first time I met Dave Grohl was Reader introduced me backstage at some, um, some I think it was a Revolver a Metal Gods Awards. She goes, hey, Dave's still here. Have you ever met him? I said, no, I'd love to. So she introduced me to Dave and she was about to say who, who I played with. And he goes, I know who you are. You played with Grim Reaper. I love that band. And I thought he was just going to say, he goes, he, and he said, there's one song I really, really like. And I thought he was going to say, see you in hell, because that's mm -hmm. one a lot of people know by default, by de facto. And he said, liar. Yeah, like, great song. And and it was like, that was never on the radio. So it's like, holy shit, this guy did own the record. And I've since, I've since got to spend some quality time with Dave Grohl because he works with us on the Ride for Dime stuff and Dime Bash. Like he, he, he actually barbecues for everyone and it takes yeah. him a day to do it. So we had a long, you know, readers like Dave, Dave likes you come, come and hang out. And we had a long talk about how things have changed. Mm -hmm. I remember back in the day, I love vinyl because vinyl had two great things. Number one, you got a 12 by 12 piece of art. Yeah. And if it was a gatefold, then you got a great story and credits and everything else. And vinyl, you couldn't go over 20 minutes aside. Otherwise, the quality deteriorated because of the, yeah. of the groove. So it was a great quality control as well. But I would buy records. If I could only buy one album, I go to the record store I put the four I wanted out and pick the one that I like the cover of the best. Okay, here we go. Here comes Alan. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, I'm going to bring on Alan. Dun, dun, dun. There he is. Okay, here he is. Okay, Sorry, he's uh, back. my internet went down. So. Yeah, I like the story. You probably just went to Starbucks. <laughs> No, the last thing I heard is a guy named Birch that was was allergic to birch, but not maple or oak trees. <laughs> yeah, he's just allergic to birch trees. So I just said it all. But anyway, so, so yeah, we we were going back to, uh, and then we start. Then I started making fun of the album cover, and then we got onto album covers. Mm -hmm. One one of the reasons, just so you know, one of the reasons, um, the Grim Reaper, because, and a lot of people like when I remember myself and Paul had this conversation, we're like, and we had a bunch of names, and Grim Reaper came up, and I said that should be the one. And a lot of people were like, what, that is that tempting fate or something? It's like, no, it's just a name for God's sake. But one of the reasons I chose it is because one of the things I think that Iron Maiden did that was really, really, really smart was the creation of Eddie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they created an image that was nothing to do with the band, but nothing to do with the band members, but was everything to do with Iron Maiden. Yeah, so yeah, it became synonymous, kind of like like how how Dave Mustaine has Vic Rattlehead. Yeah, like you see that Vic Rattlehead, you know it's you know it's Megadeth. If you see the War Pig with with um, Motorhead. Motorhead, you know it's a Mudhead album. And we figured it would be great to have some an, an image that could be instant relate instantly related to the band, and also cover up the fact that we're extremely ugly. So, <laughs> So nah, I don't we, say that. So so we actually, once again, I say, you know, with the greatest respect, see your optician because they've obviously failed miserably. But um, the we actually named if if you if you go back to the very first Kerrang we were ever in, as with Steve, 
there was a there was a grim reaper behind us like an effigy of a grim reaper that my father actually built for us <laughs> and and we would so and it's also in the first video so we actually called it freddy it's <laughs> better man in in homage to eddie and, I, and, I, and i'm sure you know where, where eddie came from right the, the, were, mask the head you know, the system. head yeah and this once again this ages me i went to see uh neil k do you remember mm, yeah. he's been on the show neil k yeah neil k did a talk neil k the dj responsible for like the new wave of british metal resurgence i guess mm -hmm. Because he had that 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 heavy metal disco, heavy metal disco. What an oxymoron! But yeah. they, they exist. I call oh. him my uncle. I call him my uncle, by the way. Oh, good. Go ahead. But they exist and they were great. He was big enough to do a tour, so he did a tour, and the the opening band, the the headliner was a band called Rage that used to be called Nuts or vice versa. I'm not not sure. I can't remember the correct order, but they were really good. But the opening bands were an unsigned Saxon and an unsigned Iron Maiden, mm. and they had the and they had the original head, which was basically a paper mache head with a hosepipe coming out of the mouth with dry ice. It was great. Did you see Iron Maiden back in the day? Did you see the the the, the early gigs before they got signed? I know that there was a sort of like thing between you and Iron Maiden, but. Did you actually see them the Paul Diano years and Yeah, I I like I saw them like like the show I'm talking about. I was at Manchester University. I saw them at a place called UMIST, which was the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. They had this huge ass hall there. And they actually put an EP out called the Soundhouse Tapes that yeah. I still have, but that that was on their own label. Yeah. And yet it was Paul and it was actually the person it was actually the guitar player, the blonde guy with the flying V prior to um what was the name of the guitar player on the first album? Terry Warpam. Warpam. Warp Warpam. Yeah, that there was that guy. Maybe there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them. We we could say there was a lot of guitars. The blonde guy? Yeah, the blonde guy with the flying V. Blonde guy. But he had a keyboard player at one time. Yeah, but the but but the rest of the band was intact, apart from you know, it's like it was obviously it was obviously Clive as opposed to Nico back then. But yeah, they were that was Doug Sampson. You're 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 talking about Doug Sampson. In the sound on drums you could be right you could be right yeah, 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 yeah. they had a revolving door for a while but 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 the main players were there yeah yeah, I mean, yeah I got and you. i love the i love diana yeah me too yeah diana is the best what was what was the gig like was it electrifying just curious was it like, yeah of course it was one of those things because it 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 was you know you you would read you know this was pre-internet so social media was sounds which then this was even before Kerrang existed. Yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. so, so Jeff Barton was one, like one of the metal guys at Sounds. And then you had, you know, the Malcolm Domes of this world. May he rest in peace as well. Right. For another, another, one. another great guy, Malcolm. Um, yeah. So you had this, we had this weekly magazine called, you know, weekly publications, the three of them, New Musical Express, Melody Maker, and Sounds. And Sounds was the one that lent towards the heavier side of things. So, that's where I, you know, like, like, like the Paul, the Paul DeMarco version of, um, or Woofer as we called him, our version of Grim Reaper, we covered um, Get Your Rocks Off before the first Le Death Leopard album came out. Yeah. Because, I wow. bought, because I bought it on Bludgeon Revolver, based on the Kerrang, on, on the Sounds piece. So, yeah, there was a, it, it was a, it was a wonderful time because you couldn't, if you wanted to find something, you had to go search like you didn't, you couldn't go on YouTube and go, oh, I'm not going to bother to watch the opening band because I've seen this some, something someone phone did on their phone and it sucks. You went because you were scared that you might miss the next Van, Van Halen. You know, yeah, because, it, yeah. And really. it was electric. It was really cool. And, and you had to, you had to trust people. You would buy things. You know, when I was talking to Grohl, he said, you said, you know, I miss those days where I would buy fanzines. So you'd buy a fanzine, which was like a podcast back then, effectively. Right. Someone would photocopy something. You know, they'd, they'd make something, they'd photocopy it, and then you sent them three or four pounds, and they'd send it to you. So I'd get stuff from America. It was freaking great. And you would take chances based on, like I said, artwork. I would buy albums. I bought the Virgin Steel album based on the artwork, and it was a damn good album. Yeah, I, no I, 
you mentioned Circus Magazine. I remember doing the same thing with Hit Parade, the up and coming bands. I think I bought the uh, Killer Dwarfs, Anthrax. Uh, I'm forgetting a few, just based on those little snippets of up and coming bands, you know. Yeah, and you'd, and you and you'd listen to what other people you admired said was good. So I bought an album called I bought a band called Head East based on Richie Blackmore saying they were great. And you'd find some gems that way, but you had to go and be, you had to be Sherlock Holmes. You had to go out there with intent. But that was, that was the fun part of it, right? Being oh, Sherlock I loved Holmes, it. right? And you had to have a good network yeah. of friends, right? Yeah, of, of, of friends that who, and by, I don't mean likes on Facebook, just because, you know, I've got a lot of friends on Facebook who I wouldn't, if they introduced me on the street, I wouldn't know who they were. Not to <laughs> like, like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a different kind of networking. And that's 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 how the Grim Reaper thing started. Was like Sand started to run heavy metal um, charts Charges. put together by by DJs like the Bailey Brothers and people like that. So I would network with I would network with those guys, and that's how we got our first chartings. And that that was just by me sitting down with a like handwriting a letter to them with with a demo tape, and then putting it in the mail and hoping. It was, it was, you couldn't email anything. It didn't exist. Nick, uh, Mike Jurgen says, uh, hi to Nick for me, please. So Mike oh, Jurgen nice. says hi to you. Mike's a great dude. Hey, Mike. Um, when, when the band sort of got some momentum, right? Right. Um, tell us about that sort of trying to break in. What was the strategy to break into North America? Well, the, the, the strategy to break into North America was, and it, this is down, there's a guy called Walter O'Brien who will, who is, who will make it to the funeral. God bless him. Um, Walter, Walter was working for, I think he was either working for combat records or metal force he, or, 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 or mega force records. He wanted to, he wanted to get the license for see you in hell because he liked it so much. Um, the, the the man who we whose name we will not mention went no you're not big enough uh, if I'm going to license it to a, an American company it's got to be a major. Um, Walter was friends with a lady called um, Wendy Goldstein, mm -hmm. who, who was who was A and R RCA, and he sent her the tapes and that's how it happened. So RCA licensed us and then uh, and then America became a real thing. But yeah. you know like they, they, you know that's one of the funny things about the like the record industry back then is that the only way a, an English band could afford to tour America, unless you were independently wealthy, was you needed the backing of a record label. And they would basically give you a tour advance that, that, that you then had to pay back from yeah, the yeah. royalties. But it was all good, you know, so the same with the video. We'd like to make a video. It's going to cost 25 grand. And guess what? You owe us that. But we, we in good faith are going to loan you that money. Yeah. With interest. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, that no, wasn't interest, but they were taking it. They, they took it from a percentage of money. They, the, but I get it. They, it was a business. It's called the music industry. Yeah. And, you know, I've always maintained that as, as, as skill, you know, we got screwed by, I, I can't blame RCA at all because we were screwed by Ebony, not RCA. Mm -hmm. But the, someone, someone goes, okay, I think this band's, got a chance and you know if you go back to the mid 80s investing over 100 grand in something that was a gamble that's a pretty because they won't get that money back so that's right yeah if so, it goes tits up they're they're screwed so yeah so and 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 they would give a band three or four, you know i always maintained that in in today's in today's recording industry queen's right would never have got the chance to make the masterpiece which is operation mind crime because they would have been dropped after the first or second records because they didn't sell that's everyone, a very good point too everyone's yeah. looking for instant gratification and not and not every band comes out of the gate like friggin van halen what was your contract like if you don't if you don't crack 100k you know and 100 units sold whether you dropped was there anything I, you know, any I think like it, was, that? it was it was it like i think it's been a long time since I looked at contracts and, and but it was, it was basically, okay. Each, each record had, had, had more money behind it. But like, does that make sense? Because you've also got to re remember, and this is, I'm not trying to stand up for the recording industry at all. No, no. But they like all of the, like the advertising, all of the advertising that sort of went into it, all the radio promotion, all that sort of stuff that was on their dime as well. So 
they would inv- and and they would also and you know like like Rocky to Hell, they paid Max, they paid for the studio. We owed them that money, but they paid for all that stuff. Whereas yeah. with Ebony, we didn't. Ebony went, "Here's the record, see ya." So, uh, which is probably where he got a bunch of money from. Yeah. But 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 anyway, so. Yeah, it was like they like they were tiered, but it was always it was always to the favor of the record company. Like 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 you read someone someone signs five year contract worth ten million dollars, they can drop that band after the first album and not, and not owe them a penny, unless they had really clever lawyers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they would keep you the more money they would. So they would, they, I guess they would look at the return from album one to see if it was worth the risk investing in album two in the hope that 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 that. The wave continues, yeah. You know what? You know, Nick, and we talked about this, and I talk about this with everybody. Let's say you wanted to start a business and you had no money, and I gave you $200,000. And in that $200,000, it included promotion for your business, it included TV commercials, it included, you know, you your living expenses, yeah. it included food. So I give you $200,000 to start your business. And I'm thinking in my head, I want to make my money back, plus I want to make a little extra. Yeah. And then you say, well, what kind of deal was this? And then you start screaming bloody murder. Wait a second. You're supposed to give me this money. <laughs> no, and I don't want to pay you back. And but... you don't get paid until I get some money back. So. Well, so, I mean, we always tend to look at the artist, but we never really look at the business side of things. And not to say artists don't get screwed. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying there is another side to it. Oh, no, there's another side to it. And it, and, and as and there's sort of. And you, you know, there are every, every, everyone has a horror story. I cannot say one bad thing That's about right. RCA. I cannot say one bad thing about RCA. They were extremely gracious. In fact, to give you an idea of what of 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 what it's of of a record label's belief in an artist in the post Grim Reaper thing, like so that so like when when it was decided that the only way forward for myself and Steve was Steve to go on to Onslaught, which as I said, mm-hmm. amazing, just an amazing album, and great vocal, obviously, duh. So I came to America and I formed a band. They said, "Okay, you can we'll we'll relocate you to L.A. or or New York. Where do you want to go?" And I instantly said, "It's got to be New York because it's condensed and it's and it's hyper." And they said, "Okay, we've got you know you know we'll pay for this, we'll pay for that, we'll pay for a rehearsal place three three days a week." So they all this money up front. That's right. And. And then you know, give us a call after two months, and and then they left me alone. And said after two months, give us a call, and because because we want to come, you know, I would check in with them all the time because they were my friends. But they said, okay, we want to come and see the band. So I put together the first, the, like the first iteration of, of a band that was called Barfly. Mm-hmm. They came down, and we played like six songs, and they took me to one. RCA took me to one side and went what are you doing i said what do you mean what am i doing they said this is this is grim reaper with a really good american singer i said yeah no crap that's what i do they said no no you don't understand listen to this skid row record this is what we want you to do. oh jeez <laughs> like, like like like, to, like we want we want this to be you know, we want the lightest of those songs to be the heaviest yada 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 but anyway so i put together a different like the band evolved and it was a really good sort of I'm biased, obviously. It was a really great collection of people, great players, great singer. Actually, we got the singer from Toxic, the band Toxic. Mm-hmm. He could sing his butt off. And we started making an album with a guy called Jack Ponty, who who's, it's, remains a great friend. He wrote songs with Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, pretty A-level, A-lister guy. And RCA kept coming to the studio, and they got so excited about the record that they actually went, you know what? We would like Michael Wagner to mix this. And I'm like, holy shit yes well and, and it, i didn't have it wasn't my yes they'd already made the decision it's like we're, I'm like, <laughs> we're just telling you <laughs> we're telling this you, is gonna happen this is gonna happen well then, this is the dark side of the record companies oh, now right no, we, like, we have no, the money and we're telling you what to do yeah, That's we the have the money and, and i was like this is amazing I, mean, I knew it was going to add you know thousands upon you know it's going to add a, an unknown quantity that went into thousands onto our bill and i didn't give a damn <laughs> because it was a Michael Wagner's mix was extraordinary brilliant man be, uh, became a great friend long story short the label were convinced the band would go gold prior to playing one date so they got we're going to do this we're going to do a bus tour of radio stations yada 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 and then within a month just as Michael finished the record they fired the president 
Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And then a new president who cleaned house. And uh, we went from, yeah. So Barfly went from the, hey guys, can't wait for the first platinum record to like, who are you and why are you in the building? Uh, yeah, that's the dark side of the record industry. Yeah. That is and, and at that point, side. like the band disintegrated. And while I was extremely proud of that record, a, a part of me is um, maybe a little bit grateful that it didn't sort of sell out my my image, if I even if I have one. So <laughs> I'm still the Grim Reaper guy. But the thing is, and I was on the verge of going back to England after that. And as a journalist, and then a friend of mine who worked for Marshall Amplifications Distributor in America approached me with regards to doing a demo, and then I became the Marshall guy. So I stayed yeah. within the industry, but from the other side of the fence. And to be honest with you, after walking after three tours and playing playing the Texas Jam, yada, 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 and not having anything to show for it, apart from some really cool guitars that I was given as an endorsee, I kind of preferred the view of the industry from the other side of the fence. Yeah. While, but yeah, but 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 you're right. It's sometimes the artist, an artist. Well, this is bullshit. I sold eighty thousand records. It's like yeah, and the record label lost how much money to give you those eighty thousand? And I'm not def- and I'm not defending the record labels oh, either. I'm, I'm just saying that there is a balance, and the record companies at the time did take advantage of that balance as well. Oh no, they well, took advantage of artists as well. And I'm not saying they didn't. Don't get me wrong. Nobody get me wrong. There's well, two sides. Yeah, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think that the thing to end it up is that as, as a young naive, like Michael Jackson, who's no longer with us, obviously, he got to the point where he could go, okay, I want 50% of the royalties or I'm out of here or whatever percentage. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, if you look at it now, you've, 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 you've got bands like Jenny, I think, and Def Leppard have done it recently where they've actually re-recorded their classic stuff so they own it. So they own the masters. That's how... Oh. Oh, Steve, you're told. frozen now. Okay, you're good. You're good. Nick, you're Nick, good. Nick. Oh my God. I... Yeah. So, um, what was he going to say? So, I remember. I remember one of my favorite. I think I mentioned this to Jimmy actually when we were talking pre this interview. I remember like seeing seeing an interview with 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 Joe Elliott during the Hysteria tour, and they just eclipsed six million record sales or something. And that the, the, was how does it feel, you know, after having because that record damped for a while. That record didn't do what it was intended, and then. I think then pour some sugar on me exploded it and then and then uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, the whole album was a single, basically. Yeah, Every yeah, song, it, Animal, it, it, and yeah. yeah, yeah. But um, so it so they exploded, and I remember never forget reading the interview, and he went, "Yeah, it's really good. Another eight hundred thousand records, and we'll be we'll." Like we'll have paid the debt off. It's like holy yeah. crap, and and they didn't spend. You know, they like they spent a year in a studio doing that record. So that, and that's you know, and you've got to remember if you're in a studio, every beer you drink, cha ching, cha ching. Right. Every every coffee, everything. Okay, I want to ask you about this. Sure. You and Steve, you're on the road. You know, first three albums, the Hell theme. How much flack did you get in the U.S. from the let's call it the Southern states? or a little more, um, you know, sensitive to hell. Did you get, you know, the people come into your shows, breaking your records and saying, these guys are Satanists, kind no, of like we, Iron Maiden did. No, we, what happened to them, you know? Yeah, we didn't get it to that level. Like you, would, you, you, would, you would get the naysayers. You would get the, you know, oh, so, 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 so you are Satan worshippers. I always likened us to like the Hammer House of Horror movies. You know those like those great movies made by you know Peter Cushing and all those guys, and it's like we're we're I'm about as satanic as Peter Cushing. I'm it's just it's it fits that the image fits the music, but it's it's a, it's it's fiction, not fact. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 there was a sense of humor, and, and as Steve has correctly pointed out, and Millie's underlined as well, that see you in hell. If someone actually listens to the lyrics, it was based on the temptation of Christ, not not it's not like a um like it's not one of, it's not come and join hell, let's go to hell <laughs> you and me yeah, let's, let's have some beers in hell <laughs> yeah it's it, that, that that kind of wasn't that that's not satan's airbnb ad that was actually from the other side yeah but, but yeah so and it was all done tongue-in-cheek which is which is part of the reason we wanted to do do um to call the last album nothing whatsoever to do with hell but we got some brute we got some brutal reviews so and and but but we would thank the reviews for it. When I'm, the so we, 
as far as in America were concerned, we didn't exist until 1984 when Stephen Hell was voted a writer for Cream, voted it one of the tests, one of the ten worst albums of the of the last 15 years. <laughs> So what we did was, so we sent her 13 Black Roses as a thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's what you should do. But my favorite review, and I think I like when someone reissued the, the album, um, they asked me to write, the, write some sleeve notes. There was this one review where this guy said, listening to this, uh, the See You in Hell, his review said, listening to this record is about as pleasurable as giving yourself a frontal lobotomy with a blunt uh Butter knife. Jeez. <laughs> you know then, what? That was it, the that was the problem, my friend, with back then too. Like a few journalists called the shots, and they could make or break bands. That was the yeah. problem too. But it, but it didn't it didn't break us. You know, like sort of you know, Beavis and Butthead didn't break us. They actually That's right, yeah, made yeah. us after the fact. And um, my but my favorite. You know, so he finished the he finished that review off with and after this record, my dog died of bowel cancer or something. <laughs> But I think, but but I think my friend, and this is straight out of Spinal Tap. We we got a review in like Rip Magazine, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Hustler Magazine embraced us. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, and 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 Hustler born you know, sexiest and, guys in music. <laughs> Go just, ahead. Just, no, because because they had a sense of humor as as did we, and they when we both saw through each other's facades, and you know, Rip Magazine came from was like like was born from like hustler oh wow yeah no, like, I didn't know. like 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 lon friend was involved but my favorite review was the one in playboy of see you in hell which was just two words is not recommended <laughs> <laughs> that was it it's for, i love that stuff and any publicity you know, is good publicity yeah and, and my favorite one of my favorite sort of sort of priceless moments was when Kerrang did some end of year awards in 87 or 86 or something and they put the and they had an award called the Grim Reaper Award for ugliest band in the world goes I remember through. this it's I great stuff this. but anyway so yeah so I I'm, I'm of the same I I look back with fondness not with not not with regret or bitterness because I through through Grim Reaper and the stuff I did with Steve, I got to do things I never dreamed I would do. Yeah, you know, from playing from playing the Texas Jam through just touring America three times, through being on Beavis and Butthead, through through being on MTV, through having this interview now under very sad circumstances. But the fact remains, as I've said, you know, the legacy for whatever reason as in jordan uh, that was all possible because of a guy because what happened was and i never finished the story when steve joined the band the way i wrote changed yeah yeah for obvious reasons because you it, and it lent towards heavy stuff you know some of rolls so oh you don't do as much flashy guitar playing as before it's like no it's about the song not the guitar playing and well, Steve, you, you, you Steve, did have a great tone. I, I, you know, you had a great good tone, a very distinguished tone on all the albums. I should say that. I know we give a lot of kudos to Steve, but your guitar tone, as Alan was saying, your solos and your tone were great. Well, thanks. Yeah, like like we took pride in, it, and, it, and, it, and it was a team effort, which is why you know, which is why we both agreed that unless we were both in the band, it would have the person, the only put member who was involved, be it me or he, it would be that then Grim Reaper, not. And I think what Alan was saying in the beginning was how you guys, like gentlemen, you know, sort of, it wasn't like LA Guns, right? You know, everybody's got a version or rat or it was you guys were gentlemen about it. And even when Steve spoke to me and Alan about it, it was very gentleman agreement, you know, very a, a nice gentleman agreement about it. And and I, I think that speaks volumes, you know, about both of you. you know? Well, thanks. Well, I think the bottom line is that like without Steve, it wouldn't have been Grim Reaper, Grim Reaper, I like to think. So his voice and my riffs were the key. Yeah. And, and people said, why don't you do it with someone else? And it's like, I don't think I could write, I would not write the same with a different voice. So I would never call it Grim Reaper for that reason. Yeah. Because it, like, like to me, Steve is an implicit part, you know, is an integral part, a very important factor. Quote, unquote, he's the voice of Grim Reaper. And, and may ever that remain. Yeah. And I, and I just like to point out a footnote, and I think Millie told me this, and Steve told me this. You know, he was a Christian, 
and he went to church. So all the people out there were saying, you know, you know, hell and Satan and all that. It was tongue in cheek, like you said. It was it was more Christian fun. Bale is not really Batman. <laughs> well done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, or should I say Patterson now? <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 funny how you know perception is people's reality. It's like I actually play at a church, and they the and the pastors there. Yeah, you're not going to believe it. The guy who wrote "See You," you know, who co-wrote "See You in Hell," is now is playing this next song for us. Because <laughs> it's funny. It shouldn't be, you know. It's uh, p- life's too short to take so seriously, and the, and you know the the woke movement is a petrifying thing. Yeah, well, let's not get into that right now. <laughs> I got a lot to say about that. <laughs> oh, although, oh, oh, although I will leave one of my favorite quotes. I mentioned Jack Ponte before, right? Jack, Jack Ponte, some a very smart guy, like like he's now in in the financial world and making killing. Someone asked him what woke, you know, what does the term? Why do why do people call themselves woke? And he said, woke is a term for people who'd like people not to realize that they're as mentally ill as they really are. <laughs> well words to that effect and i love that and we will leave that notion there but you, but you can't even order a coffee without upsetting someone but anyway but yeah okay. so back to steve yes yeah so again i'm gonna say this in the description of the video there is a donation link you know yeah. sent uh created by friends of the family and you know there's a lot of expenses be at the funeral and after the funeral. So even though it's kind of like the, the target is sort of maxed out a little bit, just keep going. It's all good. They, the money is what much needed and what you're doing there by, you know, giving a donation, you're really helping out Steve and his family, you know, who were not rich by any means who lived a modest life and they need all the help they can get. And I can say that because I'm going to say it. <laughs> well said that man. And uh, we got Exito, who said donated a big fan. And anybody who donates right now, I will will mention your name in your comment. And that's our part, doing our part, you know. Nick, is there anything else? The streaming as well, Jim, right? The streaming of the... uh... Yes, the streaming of the funeral. Yes, and the streaming of the funeral. And we'll say September 4th, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in North America and 2 p.m. UK time. There, there will be the funeral that will be held. And after the wake, there will be refreshments and drinks and a toast to Steve, uh, all provided to you by the Grimmett family, especially Millie leading that. Uh, bring what you want. They said bring with the shirts that you want. Celebrate Steve the way Steve wanted to be celebrated. And there will also be a streaming link of the funeral in the description that I'll put afterwards. After I get that, I will put this in this video. All right. I've said a lot. Alan, Nick, go ahead. Yo, know, Jimmy, you asked me to correct me if you if you you, you think you said September fourth. It's obviously going to be if it's Wednesday, it'll be September seventh. Yeah. Wednesday, so. September the seventh. Excuse me. And if it's two p and if it's two p.m. in England, it will actually be seven. Yeah, if it's p.m., which it is, yes. If it's two p.m., it'll be seven p.m. Eastern time. No, 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 no. It'll be it's a five four hour. a five hour difference. Yeah. So two plus five is. No, it'll if it's we'll 2 be. p.m., it's 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 1, 1 to 2. It's 9 a.m. Eastern Standard, 2 p.m. UK time. Somebody please get a calculator this and is, figure this, this out. It's like that old Monty Python skit where you, you never say the number three. Right? If it's 9 a.m. here, it's 2 p.m. there, correct? Well, you, are, you, you know what? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a dumbass. You are You're correct. in Central. We're Eastern. Yeah, no, 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 I'm actually Eastern. I, I was just doing the math the wrong way. You're, you're right. doing it the opposite way. Yes, yes. you're doing it the opposite that, way. We're behind. Nine if we lived, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah, but yeah. you know, you come from Britain. It's okay, so I screwed up the we'll date. It's, I screwed up the date, so we're even, well, right? Well, 50, 50, well, here, well here's, here's the true comedy of that. I have a degree in mathematics. <laughs> I just forgot plus and minus. Boom. <laughs> so close, <laughs> just a dash off. It's and I know Millie. Good. Millie teased you earlier. Uh, she when, she, when we interviewed her about a week ago, she mentioned that during the the COVID period that she was able to go back and go through everything that Steve's ever recorded. Yes. So uh, I like that little wink emoji she gave you on uh, watching this. I'm anxious to see what what they discovered during that time. So, well, good stuff. Good stuff. So, 
Yeah, but you know the and the what the great thing about Steve is, like I said, it wasn't just his voice; it was the man behind the voice, and that's what. So we're taught it's not just remembering a voice; it's remembering a man who who touched a lot of people, not just through his music, but by meeting them and being by being extremely personable. Yes, and that's a common story. Yeah, I heard Steve. I can't believe how nice he was because he made me. He wasn't you, like you'll see some guy signing. It's like this. Yeah. They, like they didn't even look at people and but 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 you'll get the true greats who 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 understand that their audience is everything and they definitely genuinely appreciate them like the steve grimmett's this world dimebag was one such character jim marshall not a rock star but to some people the ultimate rock star because as kerry king said made us all sound and look good jim was the same way he was very personal with everybody and Ditto Slash. I've done autograph sessions with Slash, with Marshall. He takes time with people. Corey Taylor, same thing. And that the latter might shock some people. Yeah, Corey Taylor made a person's 10 seconds seem like three minutes because it was just the two of them. And there's a gift to that. And, and, it's, and you can't fake that. You either feel it or you don't. Steve felt it, and that's why people... Like they like they felt some they felt a connection because it and it, there was it was a genuine connection because that's what Steve was genuine. Some nice words, Alan. Any closing remarks? No. Again, uh, let's help out Millie and then the, the Grimmett family. And uh, thanks for having Nick on today, sharing his insight and his partnership and the years of friendship with uh, Steve. We really thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure. We got to have it more often. Uh, yeah. that, that was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. And, you know, once again, I, from the bottom of my heart, which might or might, which may or may not be black. <laughs> uh, thank you both so much for the time and the genuine passion and empathy you've thrown into like paying tribute to our, to our mutual, very dear friend, Steve Grimmett. And like I said, you know, amongst the grief, I'm going to reiterate, I'm incredibly grateful that I got the chance to have him honor me by, by considering me a friend and writing, writing partner because that's priceless. And you don't meet many people like that on this planet. And if I wasn't sad, it would have meant I didn't meet Steve or know him and that's not acceptable. So I'm happy I'm sad, as sad as it is. A lot uh, of nonsense that was, but I think it made sense. Yeah. Frank Potvin says, rest in peace, Steve. I just donated to the funeral. Scott saying, we love you, Steve, Nick, Millie. I will definitely be watching the funeral and I will be blasting Grim Reaper. Klaus says, great show. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Millie saying, thank you, everyone. Support and donations. And keep in mind, again, I'll say this over and over again. It's not Millie who started this donation page. It's a friend of the family's. Who, who graciously started this because, you know, some people need help. You know, not everybody's as fortunate, right? Yep. And uh, thank you, Millie, for, you know, being brave. And we're going to have her back uh, when she's ready to be back. And uh, we'll have more on Steve because we want to keep the memory going too, right? Steve was a friend of ours and we, you know, and, and we appreciate the music that you and him created and the music he created afterwards. And, and you know, uh, it's important. And going back to me and Alan's original mission statement of, you know, keeping, you know, supporting our, our friends and our heroes, you know, that we grew up with, you know, and making sure they have a platform too. Yeah. And I'd like, I just like to reach and say this, if you haven't got Steve's later stuff, get it, especially, you know, the onslaught stuff, the Steve Grimmett's Grim Reaper stuff, the lion's heart stuff, get it all. That, that, that voice is impeccable, immaculate and brilliant on all of that stuff. And what's funny, what's not, it's that I, I just got a text. Well, I got a text this morning from a friend of mine in LA saying, thinking of you, because I was just, I was eating dinner at the whiskey, no, at the rainbow, and they played See You in Hell of the PA. Yeah. So it's kind of that, I find that thing, things like that etern eternally touching. And what's even more touching is people weren't just, aren't just playing it because of Steve's heart wrenching passing. They were playing it anyway, because yeah. it's the, because for whatever reason people like that song, and so all of those of you who do, thank you. And if you like it, donate to Steve because he's part of your music heritage. All right, I'm, stre the, the I'm, the I'm stretching. Go on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm stretching this out a little bit because people are donating, and I want to mention their names. So you know, uh, Squishy Cakes. I love yeah. that name, Squishy Cakes. Squishy Cakes. Just <laughs> 
<laughs> Squishy Cakes just made a donation. Also posted on our metal pages on Facebook. Thank you, Nick, for the great music. <laughs> thank you, Squishy Cakes. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for the name and the donation <laughs> and the kind words. You know, like you probably find it's like it's pro that's probably really Chris Jericho, but anyway. And and as I wait for other people to donate to mention their names, Nick, just tell us about Sweetwater. Uh, you know, you know, just tell us about the school and what you do there. I'm just curious. Well, I work I work for a company called Sweetwater, who were a really big internet concern in the music industry in America. I've known them and the owner for many many years because I used to come here as a marshal as the Marshall guy doing demonstrations and training. Um, they have a great um, culture. The, the store here is ridiculous. The customer service is second to none. And I figured this was going to be my last port of call before I retire. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to finish in a great place. I was fortunate enough to work for Jim Marshall for many years. And, you know, then Jim passed and I realized that my allegiance to Jim was with the man more than the brand, as great as the brand is. Hence the reason... I have Jim on one arm. Wow. And Mr. Um, the, my good buddy Dimebag on the other, because they both had a major impact on my life. I had the good fortune of working for Fender for a while and getting to work alongside one of my all time heroes, Mr. Edward Van Halen, on the Wolfgang launch. Amazing human being. What a legacy he left behind. Hopefully, him and Steve are having a beer right now. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I, so I, I do, I do what they call, I'm a content creator, which is a horrible name. I'd make videos, basically. I make Apparently videos. so are we. <laughs> yeah. So I make content. So I, I interview people, you know, from, from, from Rudy Sarzo through Dave Mustaine, through whomever they will have me do, Jim Root, yada, Corey Taylor, yada, yada. Most mm -hmm. of them all bodies of mine, which is great. I do lessons online for them as part of the social media content. I do product reviews how to do this, how to do that kind of thing. And then in the evenings to keep myself sane and because I enjoy it, I play forward what little knowledge I have via teaching. And that's huge fun for me. Okay. And yeah, it keeps me, keeps me sane. You know, it goes to show, you know, like most of my friends, you know, because I'm an old geezer. Um, most of my friends of my age have been retired for a couple of years. Um, I'm in, I'm in no financial position to do so. But the one thing I can say is that a lot of my friends who are retired aren't that happy because they spent 40 years of their life doing something they didn't like that much. And I'm still doing what I love. So I'm still working, but I don't consider it work, even though I'm probably working harder than I ever have worked. So it's all about this and, yeah. metal, and metal and music in general, because it's the, and the thing I love about metal. I said it at the start and I said it again, the sense of community is staggering. And that yeah. was, you know, and, the, and myself and Steve had a bond. So, you know, we, we would go for a couple of years without talking, but, but when we either met in person or, or online or via a Zoom or whatever, it was like we'd just seen each other yesterday. And that, once again, is a reflection on what, how good a friend he, I hate to use it, he was. Past tense is, is horrible. It's hard to use, but... Yeah, he was one of those, you know, we all, we all have friends that we thought were great. And then five years, 10 years, 15 years later, after a minute, you've run out of things to say. No such thing with Mr. Grimmett. On that note, uh, you know, Nick, again, thank you so much. Everybody, thanks for watching. Everybody, thanks for donating. And we'll have you back, Nick. It'll be a pleasure. It took this to get you, you know, to sort of spark the connection with us. But I'm happy in a, in a way it did. And we'll keep the memory alive of Grim Reaper and yourself, of course, your legacy and Steve's legacy. Well, Jim, so. and, and I run right back at you, Jimmy and Alan. Unfortunate circumstances, but happy to have met you. And now you're stuck with me. Ha! Yeah. <laughs> it's a pleasure. All right. Have yourself a wonderful day and we'll talk soon. You Thanks, Nick. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks.